one hour power by the hour our guest today for this power hour uh needs no introduction it's none other than simon brown uh he's wearing red socks and he's going to talk about wealth creation uh welcome simon thank you thanks and paul Often, ladies and gents, so what we're doing this evening is perhaps different from what we do in pretty much every other uh, power hour. Is other power hours, we kind of like down that road around the wealth creation process and what we're doing. And we're talking strategies and small caps and, and portfolio construction and all of that sort of thing. And I thought to myself, I really want to take this back to, back to core basics. Really make it you know, at, at the base of, of what are we trying to do in the process. And truth. What we're trying to do is wealth creation, right? I and mean, that, that's as simple as it is. But I think we, 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 we like to complicate. As, as, a, as, as human beings, we almost crave complexity. We, we certainly believe in the concept of complexity in that we think the more complicated something is, the better, the more valuable, the more, the more right it's going to be, the more robust it's going to be, and the like. And, in truth, the evidence is fairly scant to, 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 to support that. But nonetheless, when we come to the stock market, we can complicate. We can take it to the nth degree. It's not just the quantum of data that's been thrown at us. It's, for example, Aspen yesterday releasing their, their trading update, which I read three times. And I'm, I, I, I mean, can I get back to you? Um, you know. And, and my response was last night when I was reading it, and admittedly I was in a hotel in Durban and it was midnight and, and, I, and I'd had some wine. My thought was, you know what, I'm going to wait until 9 o'clock and see what the market tells me. And the market was down 10% and it's like, ha, there's my answer. Um, you know, they had all these moving parts and so much stuff. And, and I mean, the worst one perhaps is, is discovery. And I love discovery and I'm a shareholder in discovery. But I can't understand those numbers. So th there is a, a humongous amount of complexity within the market. And that's not even going to derivative products and swaps and all of that sort of thing. Th there certainly is just at its absolute core. There is that complexity which is there. So we embrace it and we love it and we pretend we know what, what Aspen was saying and we pretend we understand all the moving parts within Discovery. Um, and in truth, we're just happy Discovery shareholders and unhappy Aspen shareholders, certainly today, depends when you bought. But in truth, wealth creation is simple, right? Wealth creation is not a complicated process. Wealth creation is, is something that we all have the skill set to do. Um, the problem with it, probably more than anything, is that no one teaches us. You know, certainly, I mean, a long time since I was at school, um, and I don't have kids, but I'm pretty sure when I was there, they didn't teach us about wealth creation. I doubt they're teaching it today. And that's partly because, I mean, who are the role models? Who's going to teach? Who's going to teach the youth? With respect, it's not the parents, because who taught the parents? Nobody. It's not the governments, because, you know, every single government on planet Earth, bar two, have more, more, more liabilities than assets. They have more debt than they have assets. They are technically insolvent. The two being China and Japan, um, who, have, who have more money in the bank than money that they owe. Um, now, money in the bank, you know, they own the printing press. But, so who is teaching us? Who is making this work? Who is making us smarter about money? It, it, it's nobody. I mean, the JSC does the, the schools challenge and they do the university challenge uh, and, 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 and the, the brokers are out there and we've got the saving institutes and the stock organizations and the like, but it's not something it, it, that's ingrained into us. It's almost, you know, at, at first day at school, well, I don't know what day at school, they taught you to write. And that was cool. Writing was quite fun. Um, but at the same time, it's teaching me how to write and how to count. They should have been teaching me compound interest. They should have been teaching me. <laughs> no, they should have been, what they should have been teaching me was be scared of costs. That's what they should have taught me. And they didn't. Yeah, and when I say they, I mean globally, everyone. No one teaches you this stuff. So it really is simple. And that's what I want to do this evening. I want to go back to those basics. I want to go back to the core building blocks of what wealth creation is about. And the most basic and the first, first absolute part is time. Time is the most important thing we have for wealth creation. The more of it we have, the easier it is. Now, there's a bunch of folks here this evening who, much like me, are on the wrong side of 46 years old. Um, I'm soon to be on the wrong side of 47 years old. And, and we've got time pressures. I get that. 
but there's a bunch of folks here who are on the right side of 46, but it's more important than that. It's also you know, taking this, this, this knowledge, taking what we know and sharing it. The, the JC Schools Challenge, they do the awards uh, sec second to last Friday in October, um, and I have for the last six or seven years been one of the speakers of that, at that presentation. And I'm speaking to a bunch of 16 and 17 year old kids who have won prizes in the, in the challenge from around the country. They fly up from wherever they come and they get their prizes and it's a huge day for them. And one of the key things I talk to them about is responsibility of knowledge. And that responsibility of knowledge for the kids is take what they know and go back to their communities and tell everybody. You know, start with your family, your friends, your school, eventually stop strangers in the street. Now, the last part, maybe not, you know, South Africa, I'm not sure you want to stop strangers in the street. Um, probably anywhere. I mean, New York probably don't stop strangers in the street either. But it's that responsibility of knowledge. Because, you know, if we can start as kids... I've got a niece and nephew, six and eight years old, and I'm teaching them about money, and I'm teaching them about investing, and I buy them ETFs and stuff. And at this point, they think it's a joke. Um, they sing a song about their favorite ETF, BBET40, which then changed its name to CSEW40, so I have to break their hearts. We've got to change the song, guys. And at some point, they're going to hate it, right? Because at some point, they're going to be teenagers, and I'm going to give them a, a, a broker's note to say, I bought you some CSEW40, and they're going to be like, no, I'm 13. I need a motorbike or an a iPhone or whatever 13-year-olds want these days. Um, but they will get over it. But what we, it, it, it's, it's that time that they've got. Because they're young, they've got the time. Now, the key point is, you know, everyone says to me, well, they're going to be really love you when they turn 20 and get the money. <laughs> they don't get the money when they're 20. Come on, we were all 20 once, right? What did we do when we were 20? Sex, drugs, rock and roll. No chance. They can't get it when they're 30, because there's only one way you get rich in a hurry. Marry money. And someone will marry them for their money. And they can't get it when they're 40, because... 40 midlife crisis, they're going to go buy a fancy red car. So they're going to get it when they're 50. Now, they're going to hate me, but you know what? When they're 50, I'm going to be dead, so I've got way bigger problems on my hand. <laughs> the point is, is they going to, so what I'm actually going to do is every, every decade birthday, 20, 30, and 40, I will give them 5% of the fund to do what they want. When they get to 50, they get complete control of it. Um, the key thing is, is that they're going to, at the age of 50, be able to stop working completely. Not because I'm buying them vast quantities of ETFs, not because I'm buying them the ETFs, the, well, I hope I'm buying them the best in the world, but the truth is, because I did this the day my nephew was born, I bought him an ETF, and every Christmas and every birthday for him and his niece I'd do it. The secret is 50 years. That's the point. Now, we don't have 50 years in this room, although in truth, maybe we do, we're living longer, but it's that 50 years. That's the point. And, and it's not just that my niece and nephew will benefit. We create generational wealth. Their kids will benefit even more. Their kids will, or depending when they have the kids, their kids will, will, will be those, those, those gentry who don't have to work, who can, you know, do whatever they please. And, and mostly, as a rule, that generation then loses the money and we have to start again and rinse and repeat. Again, I'm dead. It's not my problem. But it's about the time. The truth is, we're in a hurry. You know, and, and, and you know, I always say, you know, it, it's, 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 it's internet and it's Twitter and it's Facebook and it's instant communication and, and, and webcasting and everything else. Um, but every generation has been faster than the previous. You know, I'm sure 100 years ago they were blaming the motor car and say, you know what, when it was a horse and buggy, it was so much more sedentary and life was easier and better and probably smelly because of the horses. But... Every generation is just moving faster and faster and faster. But we've got to use that power of the time. And it's, you know, people say to me sometimes, it's too late. Mm, it's never too late. There is an ideal time to start. Yes, there you're born. You know, it's the old cliche. Best time to plant a tree? Yesterday. Second, or 20 years ago. Second best time to plant a tree? Today. You know, we might have missed that train, but it doesn't mean that we must now completely and absolutely abandon it. We need to use that power of time. And then it's about costs. And as much as I said they should teach us about compound interest at school, what they should teach us is about the, 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 so there's a power of compound interest. There is the pain of compounding costs. Costs are the biggest enemy of humanity. 
Yeah, and, and I'm talking the financial services industry in particular. We have a, 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 an industry in South Africa with a value of approximately 5 trillion rand. And what we have is all these institutions whose sole existence is to just take small slices. You know, it's like the banks. I was explaining to my nephew two weeks ago. He's eight years old. He says, what do banks do? I said, it's really easy. Money moves around, and they just take a little bit. As the money goes past, they grab a bit, they grab a bit, they grab a bit. And he says, but what do they do? I said, no, they just grab a bit. He's like, but like, what do they do? No, they just grab some money. That, he said, that should be illegal. Ha! He read Karl Marx. He hasn't yet, but he's my nephew, so he will. So the, the, the thing is, is, is there are costs out there. And I get there's no free lunches. There are free power hours. You don't pay for this evening. But we need to pay the fees. But we need to get those fees as low as possible. And certainly, with respect to the industry, we have seen it over the last 20 odd years. I remember my first unit trust. If, you, if you've heard me in my podcast, I still hate them as a result. Um, I was paying 6% a year, and it was underperforming. There were no performance fees in 6% a year. That was platform advisor and an administrator. And back in the 90s, 6% a year was considered to be a, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, my dad. Uh, no. In credit, we need to watch. If we can, and, and the examples I've got here, I mean, just the difference between a 2% and a 5% fee, um, literally, is, is you, if you're paying 5 instead of 2, you got half the money. That half went somewhere. We've got to be ruthless with fees. We've absolutely got to be ruthless with fees. You know, I, I will look at products. Uh, first thing I do is I go to the fees. Oftentimes, I can't understand them. It scares the heck out of it when I can't understand someone's fee structure. How does my, my default is always my sister. How does she understand it when she's not in this industry? You know, how does a person in the street have any chance? So we've got to pay the costs, but we've got to get those costs down. And if we can get the, you know, as much as interest, compound interest compounds into our future, Costs compound out of our future. And if we're paying too much costs and we're using the time, then frankly, our people who are charging us are the ones who are really going to be winning rather than us in that process. So we've got to use the time. We've got to get those costs as small, as small as possible. And with those two pieces in place, the question is then really the simplest thing in the world. How do we create wealth? Spend less than we earn. It's just that simple. Yeah, I have this desire to write a book, um, but there are two problems with my book. Firstly, the title is called Get Rich Slowly. Apparently, that's never going to sell. If I told you how to get rich quickly, it would sell hundreds. The fact that I might be lying to you is apparently neither here nor there. I, I told you the tip how to get rich quick, eh? Marry money. Everything else takes time. So the book is quite simple. It's called Get Rich Slowly. And how we get rich slowly is spend less than you earn, invest the rest. That's a tweet. The publisher wants 220 pages. That's not even 220 characters. But that's the answer. So, I mean, I can make it 220 pages. I thought I would draw pictures, but my art is pretty bad. I, I, I got to apparently fluff it out a whole bunch more. But that really is spend less. We just need to spend less. And I know that it is very easy for me to stand up on a stage and say, spend less. Of course it is. I know that it is exceedingly difficult in the practicalities of life to actually spend less. There are, there are monster pressures uh, out there for our money. But I also know that in truth we've made choices. We might not have consciously made these choices, but we've certainly made these choices. I, I, in Durban last night, someone, uh, someone said to me, I can't afford to save. And I said, I don't know what you earn, but I know that there is someone out there in Durban who earns 2,000 Rand less than you, and they're surviving. And then it starts coming, well, actually, you know, my BMW is really expensive. And I'm like, well, boom. You know, and these are, and I, they, they're actually not, I called them conscious decisions. They're not conscious decisions. We don't sit down and say, let's spend more than we earn. Perhaps it's worse. It just happens unconsciously. We don't even realize we're doing it. We open a bank account, and what's the first thing the banker says? Credit card. What's the second thing the banker says? Overdraft. Third thing the banker says? Vehicle finance. Do you own a home? At what point did the banker offer a savings account? I don't, I mean, I, I don't even know if we still, is there such a thing? When I was growing up, we, we used to have things called savings accounts. That was the name of the product. 
I'm not sure that we have savings accounts anymore. Uh, we've got to put our money under our mattress or something like that. So in truth, it's not a conscious decision that we've made. And yes, we can go out and we can blame the industry and we can blame the, the adverts. My favorite was one of the big banks. I won't name them, but they kind of very blue. <clears throat> and they had an advert that basically went, get the loan to buy the TV that you need. No one needs a TV. Do we want a TV? Sure. Well, no. Because I use a TV for sport, and all my sporting teams are losing. The Sharks are losing, Vettel is losing, and the Pro Tiers, uh, five days, who knows. But do we need a TV? No. What do we need? We need a shelter, we need clothing, we need food, we need companionship, we need stuff. Yes, not a TV. The entire marketing industry is basically trying to get us to do stuff which is frankly bad for us which simply does not serve our purpose, it serves their purpose. But if we just sit back and say, oh, it's the bank's fault, it's the marketing department's fault, etc., we're abdicating responsibility for our well-being, we're abdicating responsibility for our future, we're abdicating responsibility for our children's future. The key point is recognize it and push back. Yeah, uh, 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 colleague of mine many, many years ago who, who got retrenched and was struggling to survive, and I was trying to help her go through a budget, and there's a 800 Rand DSTV subscription. What's that? Call it 10,000 Rand a year. And I'm like, you're struggling to pay school fees, but you're spending 10 grand. Oh, no, but my husband likes soccer. Um, okay, noted. But I don't understand where the DSTV comes into that. You know, because he must watch the Euro Cup or whatever the case may be. Sure. But no, you, you, you know, you, and what you need to do is make that decision and say, okay, so I can watch soccer or Johnny goes to school. Which one do I choose? Make the choice. Don't just make it wash over you, which is what we do. Actually sit down and make that choice that says, okay, so I'm struggling here, but hey, man, I'm going to do that because I want to watch the soccer. And if you've made the choice, then cool, no problem at all. It's when we don't. It's when we just sort of fall into it. So it really is a case to spend less, remove debt, save more, buy assets. One of the... Not one of. Probably the key thing I ever learned in my entire life. I was 14 years old, uh, went to my uncle's 50th birthday party, whereupon he announced he was retiring. Um, and three days later, he went back to work because he didn't know what else to do with his life. But that's not the story. And I said to him, but how do you afford to retire at 50? It made no sense to me. As I understood, retirement was 65, and he's 50, and how is he possibly retiring? And he, he's... Two, two, two things that he had done. So the one is he said, I never bought insurance. Okay, yeah, that's nice, but that's a little, you know, that works if no one ever robs you. Um, as soon as someone robs you, it doesn't work so lacquer anymore. And he was really fortunate. He was 62 before the first time he was a victim of crime. And they stole a Nokia 3510 off him, and really no one misses the Nokia 3510. Um, but the second thing he said to me was, I've only ever paid cash only ever paid cash. I don't think I've met another human being in my life who's only ever paid cash. No, not me. No, oh, okay, no you know one. No one. So now there are two out there. <laughs> only ever paid cash. Ponder that a moment. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that he didn't have stuff. He drove a Mercedes-Benz, got a new one every couple of years. Point is, paid cash. Didn't mean he didn't have a house. Just means that the first house he bought was 25 square meters in Berea, Durban. It was a flat. And then he went to 30 square meters. And eventually, when, when he's now living in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a retirement village in, in, in KZN, but before that, he owned 95 hectares in, in Dargle uh, with two dams on the property, a 10,000 bottle wine cellar, and so on and so on. But it was he only ever paid cash. And we don't. Society doesn't do that. We flash credit cards. We run debt. The banks are, oh, we see you've used all your debt. I, I, so, so you think you're about to get scolded by your bank. No, no, they say, do you want more? <laughs> it's like, how's that helping me? Short answer, it's not. How's it helping the bank? Well, oh, they love debt, don't they? Because they charge us. 
Uh, the top tip there, of course, if banks are these evil, nasty, money-grabbing things, yeah, buy a bank and rip off your friends. I mean, if they're making money by running scams, legitimate scams, we should all own some banks so we can get a slice of the action. But it is that simple. It's spend less, it's get rid of debt, it's save more, it's buy assets. So, let's delve into some practicalities. We think to ourselves, oh, but small amounts of money, how's that going to have an impact? What's that difference going to be? I can only do X. It's not about the, the quantum, it's about the doing. Once we start that process, it becomes so much easier. More than just becoming easier, it becomes, it becomes sort of second nature. It just becomes something we do. You know, I, I, so I, 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 yeah, I, I, do I, I, have a, I have a home loan. There's reasons behind that. But broadly, I have tried to follow my uncle's theory. In my 20s, I did maybe not so well. I remember particularly a pair of boots from Edgar's, which I had to own. So I had to go and take an Edgar's account. Um, at one point, I had a Woolies account as well. Um, and and I, was, I had a Markham's one as well because I wanted suave suits and stuff like that. But as I've got older, I've gotten smarter with it. And now I don't have any of those at all. And what it means is that when I want something, it's like, well, okay, then I can have it in six months. It's that, pr that process we come into. It's the mindset that we create. We create it within ourselves, but more importantly, we create it within our families. That's what really matters. And so, you know, run some examples here. These are supplied by Standard Online Share Trading. We're talking tax-free accounts because your first 30000 every year that you invest must go into a tax-free account. Thereafter, we can debate, but the first 30000 So the assumption here is a growth of 15% and a dividend yield of 2%, which historically over the last 20, 30 years is an accurate return going forward. I think we might see lower numbers going forward because of lower inflation, but we'll run with what we have best. Assuming that you pay brokerage of a quarter percent, no admin fee, and you do your 2,500 rand per month um, until you've reached your lifetime goals. And in, we look at that and we think, so how much does that truly become? Well, after 25 years, it comes out at just over 11.4 million rand. And the smart folks in the room here are saying to me, ha-ha, but what is the inflation? What is that money in today's spending? So can we agree that inflation will be 6% over the next 25 years? Because if we do, I can do the math in my head. Okay, so if inflation is going to be 25%, sorry, 6% over the next 25 years, in today's money, 11.5 million is approximately 3 million rand. In today's money. Is that enough to retire? Eh, depends on our habits. But certainly it's 3 million rand in today's money. There is no one in this room, if I say, here's 3 million rand in cash, he says, nah, don't need it. <laughs> I tell you what, if I went to Warren Buffett and offered him 3 million rand in cash, well, he might say, what are rands? He would take it. He would give it to a charity, but he would take it. Right? No one's turning down 3 million rand in cash. And let's be honest. So, for some folks, 2,500 is an inaudible amount of money. Yes. For other folks, 2,500 rand uh, doesn't even buy you tires for a car. And if we're saying we haven't got it, we need to go back to this picture first and say, are we really getting that debt down? Are we really managing that process? Are we really making sure? Are, are, we, are we in charge of our finances? Or is this just a mad scramble to the next payday? For most people, it's a mad scramble to the next payday. And again, I say, it might not be a conscious decision that we've made, but it's worse if it's not a conscious decision. If you've consciously decided to be chronically over-indebted uh, and struggle to make payments and never get to retirement because you never saved, it's not a good decision, but at least we made a decision. And then we come to that retirement. So 65 is the new 46 until October when 65 becomes the new 47 because I'm 46. The key point is, we, and, and we intuitively understand this, but the retirement industry as it exists right now is fundamentally broken. And here's the first example. Uh, the retirement industry comes out of Germany in the 1880s. Kaiser Wilhelm, what, he, what happened was he had had the war with uh, Prussia or whoever, and he had all these soldiers who had come back and he needed to do something with them. Um, so he created this retirement thing. But then he realized this was going to cost money. So he said, oh, okay, so you can only get retirement at a certain age. 
And he very craftily made the age of retirement 65. Because life expectancy in Germany at that point was 63. You see the cunning part, right? If you get to retirement, we will give you money. <laughs> and you'll probably last, maybe you'll make 70. Maybe you'll make 70. But that's no longer the case. The other thing we had back in the day, in fact, as recently as the 1980s, um, we had what we called defined benefits. In other words, the, the plan was you joined a company at the age of 20 and you worked until 65, and at the end they gave you a check every month based on your last salary. Um, and what happened, and, and we look at companies like General Motors, and that's why they went bankrupt, because they had these liabilities that they could no longer pay, because they were guaranteeing money and they couldn't pay it. Now we have defined contribution, which says, well, you know what, you give us the money, we'll invest it, when we get to retirement, we'll give it back to you, kind of maybe if we made profit, as long as we've taken our fees first. That was the other thing I bought in the 90s, was a retirement annuity. I'm not going down that road again. Go listen to the podcast if you want to hear me rant about the evils of retirement annuities in the 90s. I appreciate they are renewed products, but you know what? Burn me once, shame on you. You're not going to burn me a second time. What we now have is basically the buck has been passed to us. In terms of, yeah, we will invest your money and we will take fees. And if we are smart enough, we may grow it. Will it be enough to retire on? Well, who knows, you know, moving parts, et cetera, et cetera. So in a very short period, just from the 80s in this country, we had to define benefits. Now, FLIP went to define contributions. And that has had a fundamental change. And the key point is, we live longer. Our life expectancy is no longer 63 years old, as it was in Germany back in the 1880s. The life expectancy, if you are 60, there's a 50% chance you get to 90. Just 30 years ago, if you were 60, there was a 50% chance of making it to 75. The first person to live to 150 is probably already alive. It's probably none of us. I think it's my mother-in-law. <laughs> Actually, that's a great idea. When my niece and nephew aren't happy, they can go talk to her because she will outlive us all. That is cunningly her plan. But these are real implications. These are the real implications. And at 65, if you work for a normal corporate, what happens? They give you a, I was going to say a gold watch. They probably give you a plastic watch um, and a little farewell party with some fruit juice and send you on your merry way. And now what? And if we haven't taken responsibility, we're now liable to the state state pension under 1,500 rand per month, so good luck with that. We're now liable to our families. And this is partly why we need to take that responsibility. This is why we need to make sure that we're in control of that process. And the other point, and, and this is slightly off topic, but what are we going to do for those 30 years between 65 and 95? I mean, there's only, only so many blankets we can crochet or, or books that we can... I mean, I don't... I mean, you know, I, so my, my cunning plan was to surf. And then, I, you know, I was surfing this morning. Um, and my body, like, aches after surfing. I don't think I'm going to be able to surf as an 80-year-old. So what do we do there? So, I mean, the first thing is, what we do live in at this stage in 2016 or in this century is we live in the golden age of knowledge in terms of distribution of knowledge. The previous time we had such a golden age goes back to 1500 and the invention of the printing press. Before then, the ability to move information around was difficult, was restricted, mostly to the, to the, to the religious organizations, um, and the ability to control information was absolute. Uh, printing press came and fundamentally changed that. Suddenly I could say something and I could make a thousand copies and I could distribute it across Europe and it would only take three weeks. And we think three weeks is a long time, but back then that's how long it took to get from one side of Europe to the other. Um, what we have now is something called the, the internet. So I met someone in Cape Town last week, uh, he's probably in his 40s somewhere, he's a trained school teacher, he's a very unhappy trained school teacher, so he's doing the MIT online courses. He's training as a structural engineer. And I'm like, 
craziest thing ever. So the, the biggest problem is he has, he doesn't get a certificate at the end of it. He says, but that's fine. He says, you know, I'm going to be, I'll learn about structural engineering. I'll go and do an appy job or something like that. You know, he's a teacher. He's not making a heck of a lot anyway, but he's basically retraining himself. There is almost nothing we can't learn. The other chap on I was complaining, uh, he, he can't find any JavaScript coders who are any good. And I'm like, well, then go, go, go to uh, 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 Corsa or Code Academy uh, and go learn JavaScript. And he's like, oh, you can do that? Yeah, go learn JavaScript. Truth is, don't learn JavaScript. It's a terrible language. Learn C Sharp or something like that. But, you know, it's debatable about which language to learn. But we can reskill ourselves. The idea, which is what my uncle had, who he was a civil engineer, he built roads. Um, that's what he did in his life. And his ability to reschool himself was absolutely zero. And when, when he hit retirement age, he didn't know what to do. So he retired at 50, and that didn't work. He went back to work, and then he got to 65, and he was forced into retirement. So he built a house, and, and then he didn't know what to do, so he built another house. And, and then he got too old to build houses, and then he's like, well, now what do I do? So he's going out of his mind. I mean, he's going crazy. So I keep on sending him uh, uh, links to learn JavaScript and stuff like that. And <laughs> he's always thought I was crazy. Now he thinks I'm crazier. I'm like, no, dude, go, go learn JavaScript. Go make an app. He doesn't know what an app is either. He still misses his Nokia 5210. Um, but we can reskill ourselves. And in part, that's exactly what we're doing here this evening. We are skilling ourselves. Not necessarily for a career in the financial services industry, this skill is something we're going to use directly. Inversely, it is a skill which can germinate and get you into financial services industry if that's where you want to go. But our ability to learn these days is only restricted by A, our access to internet, and B, our desire to learn, whatever it is might be. And then I want to touch on expectations, and I'm going to get into some more nuts and bolts. So I've been joking and saying that the only way we get rich in a hurry is to marry money. And, and it's a joke, but in truth, <clears throat> it's perfectly true. You know, there's lotto and stuff, but as they say, lotto is for attacks on people who can't do math. Um, there's a mismatch between our expectations and what we are hoping to achieve from the stock market. We often, we find ourselves... In a, in, a, in, a, in a, I mean, I've had the conversation with people who, you know, oh, something's I'm, I, you know, going away in a few weeks. I need some spending money. I think I'll start trading the market. It's like, well, yo. <laughs> there was a, a, a woman who phoned me. I was still working in a broker in those days in January of 2008. She had 100,000 Rand. She wanted to put it in the market so that when she got married at the end of the year, she would have 150,000. And I'm like, that's really cool, but what happens if you only have 50,000, only one of you gets married? <laughs> and she thought I was the terriblest oak in the world. And, and you know what? So she didn't open an account with, 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 with the company I was with, but make no mistake, she probably shopped around, she probably found someone who said yes, <coughs> and what do we know, excuse me, about 2008? Worst financial crisis since the 1930s. It's not that in January I knew we were going to fall 50%, not at all. But it turns out we did. We have ourselves horrible jobs that we hate. We have ourselves unable to survive to the end of the month because we've got too much debt. Actually, no, we don't say that. We can't survive to the end of the month because we don't get paid enough. <laughs> Anyone in this room think they get paid enough? Just checking. Not a soul, hey? You see, I mean, point made. The trick is, is that we look to the stock market to solve problems the stock market can't solve. The stock market is not going to make us quick in a hurry. The stock market is not going to make your job great. The idea is I have a terrible job. I know what I'll do. I'll come to one of these power hours. I'll learn to day trade. And by the end of the week, I can tell my boss to go ahead off the train, and I'll go and be a day trader. Anyone here doing that? I know a few traders who are successful. The Garth McKenzie's, Warren Peacock's, Petri Raiden, Hayes, and the like. Um, I don't think any of them took less than five years to become skilled in trading. So we have these issues and we look to the market. We think that this is our solution. In truth, if you hate your job, uh, change it or, or you know, get a new career. And I appreciate, again, it's easy for me to stand up here and say this. But what we tend to do, and again, with the debt issue, where we don't consciously do it, but it happens to us. And what we do, typically, 
well, not typically, far too often, is we're not happy, but we kind of think something will happen and improve it. You know, our boss will get hit by a bus, maybe. Ha <laughs> ha, cunning. Or maybe we'll win the lotto. Or perhaps we'll get a giant raise. These are all wishful thinking. I mean, are any of these possible? Sure. But you're betting your future and your happiness on it? That's a mug's game. You don't like your boss? Ask for a transfer. You don't like your boss? Have en engaged with the process. Don't say to your boss, hey, dude, this is not working. Or do debt, as the case may be. We need to make a different plan here. Leave. And I, again, with 25% unemployment, I'm not suggesting you leave your job. But d don't think that the market is going to solve it. Don't think that we're over-indebted and the market will save us. The market's not going to save you if you're over-indebted. The market is not going to give you a wonderful job. The market can do a lot, but it can't do those. Those are our responsibilities. We need to take control. And that comes back to the point earlier. If you've got tons of debt and you consciously did it, no problem. And you know what it's costing you and you know the implications, no problem. If you've got tons of debt and you completely don't know where it comes from and how this happened, problem. Ain't no one who cares about your life more than you. We need to take that responsibility and do something with it and, 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 and take control of it. And we need to focus on these two things. So now we're bringing in balance sheets and those sort of fun things like that. And I remember the first time I ran into balance sheets, and it was hugely exciting because I was only 12 years old, so I had no liabilities. It was the best looking balance sheet in the world. I think my net worth was 19 rand, and I was like completely rolling in it. In essence, there are two sides to it. The one is assets, they have value, you own it, it pays you money. The critical part is it pays you money, it doesn't cost you money. And the other side is liabilities, which has use perhaps at best, somebody else owns it, and it costs us money. And this is something we need to, again, be consciously controlled of. There's an example, uh, a bit dim on the screen, but we put our assets, we put our liabilities, do we have a positive net worth? We need to be focusing on building the investment part and reducing the debt part. None of this is rocket science. We all know how to do this, more or less. I know we weren't taught at school, but we know that if we've got too much debt, and we know how to get rid of it. You know, how do you get rid of credit card debt? Well, first thing is cut the card up and throw it away. Second thing is pay the thing off and don't renew it. Problem solved. Easy to say. I appreciate that point. But we need to take control of it. We need to be saying to ourselves, where are we going? What is the plan? What are we trying to achieve? What we're trying to achieve is lots of those things, assets that pay us money. I got dividends just the other day. Who did I get dividends from? I can't remember what company it was. City Lodge, maybe? Can't remember. Dividends arrived. Free money. Best thing in the world. It is my favorite email in the whole world when my broker sends me an email and the subject line is dividends received on your account. Man, you know what? It's, uh, is it better than wine? <laughs> tough call. Tough call. But it's, it's up there. So let's quickly run through some of them and I want to quickly go through some what I will call misnomers. The first is we say, ah, we have a house. It is an asset. No. A house is not an, well, it is technically an asset, but it is certainly not an investment. A house is exceedingly expensive to run, exceedingly. We did a, a, a podcast on Fat Wallet, the links are there, uh, Christia van Heeren and myself, where we go and run the numbers. And at best case, at best case, maybe if you're really disciplined about the process, owning a home is equal to investing in the market. What we're saying is, don't own, rent. Take the difference, invest. You come out ahead. Now, I appreciate the emotional reasons to own a home. Um, but we've got to be... So I use my own example. I live in a house. We have four bedrooms, a cottage on the property with the housekeeper stays in a laundry room, a garage, a giant-sized lounge, and oddly enough, a fairly small kitchen. It's my wife and I. I can go a week without seeing her because the house is so damn big. <laughs> Why do I own that house? You know why? Because I have stuff. The problem I have is that I need a bigger house. Because it turns out four bedrooms or whatever, I think it's 380 square meters. It turns out 380 square meters is not enough for my wife, me, and our stuff. <laughs> I have rooms for holding stuff. What stuff? I don't know because I don't go into the room. I haven't looked at it. It's just stuff. 
So my current bender is I want to live in a 50 square meter place. Yeah, I know, that's what, actually my wife didn't laugh, she cried. <laughs> but surely 50 square meters, that's 25 square meters each. That's a lot of space. It's a lot less stuff. But you know what? All that stuff cost me money and I don't use it. I don't do it. I don't, it's complete and utter waste. If you want to be a property mogul, then go and buy PropTrax 10, the ETF. Boom. Now you own some Santon City, you own some v and Waterfront, you own some Hyde Park, some Rosebank. Your house is not an investment. And then if you think the house is bad, the car. So I didn't bother to run the numbers here because they're just so completely terrifying. But so cars are not cheap. A car is quite easily costing you 5,000 Rand a month with repayments and tires and insurance and petrol and all of that sort of thing. 5,000 Rand a month, approximately 60,000 Rand a year. You're going to have a car for 40 years, uh, approximately 3 million Rand excluding inflation. And at the end of it, you spend 3 million rand, and all you have is a car. A nice car, maybe. Can you sleep in it? Because that might be your retirement plan. <laughs> so what you do notice with successful people, Paul Theron from Vestac was, um, was being interviewed by Bruce Whitfield a few weeks ago. He drives a 1993 Mercedes-Benz. Now, I've seen his car. In truth, he really should replace it. <laughs> But I think for him it's become a badge of honor. Cars are nice. Yeah, I'm 46, I'm having a midlife crisis, so I went and bought myself a Roadster. First rule, second hand. Second rule, cheapest one I could possibly find. So I got a Mazda MX-5. I know, poor man sports car. Damn right it's a poor man sports car, otherwise known as cheapskate's sports car. I'm a cheapskate. How do I fund it? Cash. Now, I understand. Let's go to the process. First car I bought, I didn't fund cash. I was 25 years old. I couldn't afford to pay cash. I had a 10% deposit. I paid it off over four years, but I kept it for eight. And at the end of the four years payment, I kept on making those payments into a savings account. And at the end of the process, I went and I bought my second car, and I had a much bigger deposit. And I paid it off over two years, uh, and it was a Peugeot, it was the horriblest car in the whole wide world. So I then g got rid of it, and then I got my third car I ever owned, and I paid cash for it. And then I smashed it last year, so I had a crisis and bought a Roadster. Would I like to be driving a, I don't know, giant-sized fancy car with more airbags than I've got bottles of wine? Sure. Yeah, why not? But I look at it and I think to myself, you know what, the little car does all that I need as well. And I'm not saying you need to go and buy yourself an, an Atos or an I-10 or, or whatever the case may be. Although, frankly, you know, as long as it's got aircon and airbags. But, you know, we, we, how do we buy, when we're buying cars and houses, what do we do? We sit down very responsible, right, and we work out our budget. And we work out that we can buy a car for 250000 Let's say. So what do we do? We go look at cars that cost 350000 <laughs> Because why? Well, because the 250 ones weren't as lani. You know, it didn't have park assist or, or, or whatever the case may be, or panoramic, panoramic, panorama sunroofs, etc., etc. And then we realize, oh, we can't afford 350000 And the agent says, ha ha, we've got this cunning thing called lease. Basically, never own a car in your life. Pay me money until you die type of scenario. We do the same with the house. I know I've bought two houses, um, as much as they're incredibly bad investments. But both times, what did my wife and I do? We worked out a budget and looked at houses that cost more, without fail. That's what we do as human beings. But what we've got to do is, again, be conscious and pull it back. And we can get perfectly nice little roadsters for, for, for secondhand cheap for next to nothing, ah, for the same price as a new Atos. Atos, Atos, whatever it is. We need to make the conscious decisions, not just drift along and say, that beautiful red car, think I must own one. Now, nah. get rid of debt. More than anything, but this is the problem. 
and I, I spoke right up front where I said that the, the issue is really, really quite simple, is that it's not that it's too easy to get debt, which it undoubtedly is, and that's even with the National Credit Act and the Consumer Protection Act and the like, which has frankly made it more ha harder, but it's still too easy. Um, at least we no longer get, well, that wasn't really prevalent here. Uh, at, uh, people I knew lived in the States. They used to, on average, get six credit cards in the post every week. All you have to do is turn the credit card over, phone the company and the, phone the number in the back, and they were activated like that. So whenever they wanted to do, go on a holiday, what would they do? Well, they would randomly pick up a credit, oh, that one. <coughs> activate it, go on holiday. Oh, we need a new car. Uh, that one. Activate it, go on, buy a car. And very quickly, they had 900,000 US dollars of debt. Two, well, kids, they were, they were in their early 30s because they just kept on getting sent these credit cards. It comes back to what Michael said, pay cash as far as humanly possible. If you've got debt, get rid of the debt. Just make it gone. Just, just absolutely make the debt gone and buy assets. Are we going to have to make sacrifices to make that debt gone? Yes, probably. But who are we making those sacrifices to? Us, just in the future. If we go crazy now, who pays? We do, in the future. Why are we shafting ourselves? What did we ever do to ourselves that we hate ourselves so much? No one else is getting hurt by our, our consumption, by our debt, by our processes. We are the ones who suffer for it. And we, again, maybe not willingly, but we are doing it. We need to make it that conscious. We need to step back from that process and say, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And why the heck are we basically shafting 60-year-old me? I, I know what part of it is. I remember being young uh, and thinking that, you know, 60-year-old me was so far away that something will happen between now and then. Now I'm 46 and 60-year-old me is like <laughs> touching distance. Actually, it's 50. So, so 60 doesn't scare me. 50 scares me. I don't know why. Maybe a few 50-year-old folks can help me get over the fear. But I'm exactly three years, one month, and 27 days away from being 50, and it's scaring the behekness out of me. 40, bar humbug. 30, huge fun. 50, I don't know. Something about it which says dangerous. Get rid of the debt, buy the assets. How do we get rid of the debt? The first thing is, what is your debt? Sit down, work it out, figure. You've got four debts. There they are. There are your payments, what you have to do every month that are required for the debt. What are we doing? We're making the payments, and of course, we're just respending the money. Stop respending the money. Find an extra 10% somewhere. How do you find the 10%? Somewhere find that extra 10% and find your most expensive debt. Put that extra 10% into that most expensive debt. Make it gone. As soon as the expensive one is gone, move to the next one. Now you've got the 10% plus the money you were paying. Make the next debt gone. It starts slow and then it snowballs. It's called the snowball method. Because it starts slow, but as soon as that first debt is gone, the second, third, fourth, and fifth just disappear. They just melt away like there's no tomorrow. And you know what you've got suddenly? And, and uh, the, 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 the assumption here is that you don't then go and re-debt the debt. Because what have you now got? You've got yourself 1,750 rand every month floating around. To do what with? To save? To save for the holidays that you... Paying for, you're paying for this year's holiday next year. You're paying for this suit next year. Instead, we save when we pay for next year's suit next year. When we get there, we've got the cash. Always pay cash. Suddenly, we can always pay cash. The weird thing with paying cash is I always naively assumed that when you pay cash, you get a deal. So I buy a card almost exactly a year ago, and you say to the dealer, paying cash, do I get discount? <laughs> Don't be stupid. Because if you take credit, he gets kicked back, doesn't he? He doesn't like cash. He deeply doesn't like cash. He wants you to take credit because then he earns money from the institution who's giving the credit who gives him a kickback. We do that, the debt fades away incredibly quickly. We bring the discipline in so we don't renew the debt and suddenly we're sitting a whole lot more comfortable. And it makes for a tough period while we're paying it off. But as soon as it's paid off, the toughness is gone. And in fact, we're in a whole better place because now we have extra cash every month. So we don't have to sacrifice. 
Now we've got 1,750 a month. So we can take 1,000 rand and save it, and we can take 750 rand and do something with it. In fact, our life is better. And then that money that we're saving, I use the, euthanism, the, the, the colloquialism that says saving, but in truth what I mean is we go and buy assets. We go and buy things that pay us money. We buy things that work for us. We buy things that put money into your bank account and that don't require effort or hard work or anything like that. And it's the easiest thing in the world. We go and buy shares. They pay us dividends. They make us capital appreciation. We can start with exchange-traded funds. There are the three if you want to know what to buy. And we start buying those. And because they're ETS, every quarter they give you some money. What do you do with it? Well, because we're young, we reinvest it. Well, I'm young for another three years, one month, and a couple of days. <laughs> and then we reinvest the money. And as much as we snowball the debt down, we snowball the assets up. Again, it starts incredibly slowly. But suddenly it starts gathering momentum. There are, and I was trying to run the numbers, but I couldn't, I couldn't pull the data accurately enough. But th there, are, there are certainly dozens and dozens of shares in the JSC that if you had bought them 20 years ago, the dividend you receive today is more than you paid for the share. And the youngsters are thinking, 20 years, I haven't got 20 years. You have, you're going to live to be 150. You've got 120 years. <coughs> so, as I said, we start with tax-free, first 30,000 in there. If we want to complicate it, because I'm doing a power hour here, and I'm talking to folks who, who are significantly more knowledgeable about stock markets than the average person in the street, if we want to get really complicated, we can do core and satellite portfolios, where we start with the core of our portfolio with ETS 50, 100% into there for most people. For 99.4% of the population, we do 100% of ETFs. That 0.6% of the population is you folks here who know a heck lot more than the average person in the street. But to me, my response is always, so I, I use my sister's neighbor as an example, because if my sister needs advice, she phones me. That's cheating. But what does her neighbor do? Her neighbor can't phone me. So what does her neighbor do? Just buy 100% in ETFs. If we want to get fancy about it, we can push that number down and we can go and put some individual shares around. Disclaimer, I own all of them. They're not recommendations. They're all brilliant companies, but... So we can make it absolutely deadly simple. When I say that my niece and nephew will be rich at 50, they will. And what have they got? They've got 100% ETFs. They have those three ETFs. What we're using there is not my skill in picking. What we're using is the time. And we just build on that part. And then we can add some bits around. Careful of the bits around, because what do we typically do? We go buy dodgy platinum miners that fall down their own mine shaft. Or, you know, there, there's just far too many companies that don't make it, and we get attracted to them like moth to a flame, and we know exactly what happens when the moth gets to the flame. It's a ball of flame, and there's no more moth. So we've got to, in a sense, protect ourselves from ourselves. Because that is the market. So that's one of the most amazing charts I've ever seen. I discovered it for the first time in August of last year. Um, it happens to be our top 40. It is an annual chart. I'd never seen an annual chart before. I'd seen daily, I'd seen hourly, I'd seen weekly and monthly. That is an annual chart going back to 1997. I don't have more data. But there's one key thing we can see from that chart. The markets go up. This is how we create wealth. Right back to what I said at the beginning. Spend less than we earn, take the difference, and stick it into that beast. Yes, and there was the crisis of 2008, which is the worst financial crisis since 1929. So unless you are approaching, how old would you have to be? You'd have to be 87 years old. So if you're 87 years old, that's the, you've had two bad crises in your life. For the rest of us, we've all had one. I hope it stays one. It probably won't. There will be more crises out there. But we get all stressed about the day-to-day -day movements. And I remember that. I was working on a trading floor when the markets were crashing and people are frantically phoning and TV stations want to know what to do, etc., etc. What does Warren Buffett do? Blood on the floor, 
time to buy. Very easy to say, harder to do. But the lagger shares that I bought back then, the lagger ETFs. So at that point, you were buying Satrix 40 for 18 Rand. Today, Satrix 40 is 46 Rand. We can get clever and try and time it. In truth, the more sensible thing is just to bang a debit order every month. Ping! Buy some. So you buy some at the highs, you buy some at the lows, you get rand cost averaging over the period of the time you're building up, you're creating that wealth. Rocket science required, zero. I mean, it should be, it goes back to what I said, taught at schools, taught at universities, taught at places of worship, taught at work, taught everywhere. It isn't. That's your responsibility of knowledge, to go and share it. The key point, slowly, doesn't happen overnight. Very little happens overnight. It's a process. It takes time. It absolutely takes time. The bigger key point is that this is something which every single person, I'm going to preface that, every single employed person, because we have a poverty problem in this country, every single employed person has the capacity. Everyone, every single one of us has that capacity to create that wealth, to not just find ourselves in bad financial positions because we hadn't taken active decisions and we were pushed into decisions that were bad for us but good for the institution pushing us. If we make the decisions active, if we say, hang on a second, this is my future I'm worried about. No one cares about my future more than me. I need to make sure I'm doing something about it. Having made that decision, it's just a case of nice, simple, let's move forward. Let's go and get rid of that debt. Let's go and, 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 and buy ourselves some boring ETFs every, every month. Let's put them in a tax-free savings account and let's come back in a couple of decades' time. And in the meantime, our life is not going to be that much horrible or worse. We're still going to have a building to live in. We're still going to have a motor car. We can still even have a nice motor car. Maybe we get a 1 Series instead of an X8 or whatever the big one is. So my knowledge of cars is exactly zero. And we just fire and forget, and we take that responsibility, and we do it. And as I said, the rocket science required is exactly zero. The, the, the decision needs to be made, but the process is not hard, is not difficult, and it works. We know it works. We intuitively know. We, I show you the numbers. They, they're real, but I don't need to show you the numbers. You understand that. It's why you had a JSC event. We get that this absolutely does work. And we go, we buy ourselves the assets, and we reap those rewards. Now, as I said right up front, we reap them. We do. To varying degrees, depending how close to 50 we are. The next generation really, really reaps the rewards. Because they get two things they score. They get your knowledge, knowledge that we weren't given. And they get your money when you die. They might love you for the money more than the knowledge. In a sense, it's almost, it's almost irresponsible to not make the next generation wealthy because we have it within our capacity. We can do it. We can make our life better. We can make our retirement better. We can make the next generation's life significantly better than ours. And if we don't do it, why? We have to. It's the, and it comes back to the point I made. It's the responsibility of knowledge. The first to yourself, the next to your family, and then to total strangers in the street. Okay, maybe not the total strangers in the street, but certainly to colleagues at work, places of worship, etc. Go and evangelize. Ladies and gents, a heavy presentation in places, but I wanted to go back to those basics because it is basic and this is what we're doing. And we absolutely can do it. So I'm going to park it there. I thank you for your time this evening. I hope you all go out there, make pots and pots of money very, very slowly, and tell your friends about it. Thank you very much for your time this evening.